3. The greatest practicable amount of liberty to each individual. Liberty. Freedom. Right. The vital principle of happiness. The one perfect law. The soul of everything that exalts and refines us. The one sacred sound that touches a sympathetic chord in every living breast. The watchword of every revolution in the holy cause of suffering humanity. Freedom. The last lingering word whispered from the dying martyr's quivering lips. The one precious boon, the atmosphere of heaven. The one mighty breath, which shall, like a whirlwind, scatter in its breeze the whole dark pile of human mockeries. When is liberty to take up its abode on earth? What is liberty? Who will allow me to define it for him, and agree beforehand to square his life by my definition? Who does not wish to see it first, and sit in judgment on it, and decide for himself as to its propriety? And who does not see that it is his own individual interpretation of the word that he adopts? And who will agree to square his whole life by any rule, which, although good at present, may not prove applicable to all cases? Who does not wish to preserve his liberty, to act according to the peculiarities or individualities of future cases, and to sit in judgment on the merits of each, and to change or vary from time to time with new developments and increasing knowledge? Each individual being thus at liberty at all times, would be sovereign of himself. No greater amount of liberty can be conceived, any less would not be liberty. Liberty defined and limited by others is slavery. Liberty, then, is the sovereignty of the individual, and never shall man know liberty until each and every individual is acknowledged to be the only legitimate sovereign of his or her person, time, and property, each living and acting at his own cost and not until we live in society where each can exercise this inalienable right of sovereignty at all times without clashing with, or violating that of others. This is impracticable just in proportion, as we or our interests are united or combined with others. The only ground upon which man can know liberty, is that of disconnection, disunion, individuality. You and I may associate together as the best of friends, as long as our interests are not too closely connected, but let our domestic arrangements be too closely connected, let me become responsible for your debts, or let me, by joining a society of which you are a member, become responsible for your sentiments, and the discordant effects of too close connection will immediately appear. Harmonious society can be erected on no other ground than the strictest individuality of interests and responsibilities, nor can the liberty of mankind be restored upon any other principle or mode of action. How can it be otherwise? If my interest is united with yours, and we differ at any point in its management, as this difference is inevitable, one must yield, the other must decide, or, we must leave the decision to a third party. This third party is government, and thus, in united interests, government originates. The more business there is thus committed to governmental management, the more must each of the governed surrender his liberty or his control over his own and the greater must be the amount of power delegated to the government. When this becomes unlimited or indefinite, the government is absolute, and the liberty and security of the governed are annihilated, when limited or definite, some liberty remains to the governed. Experience has proved that power cannot be delegated to rulers of states and nations, in sufficient quantities for the management of business, without its becoming an indefinite quantity, and in this indefiniteness have mankind been cheated out of their legitimate liberty. Let twenty persons combine their means to build a bridge each contributing twenty dollars, at the first meeting for business it is found that the business of such combinations can be conducted only by electing some one individual deciding and acting power, before any practical steps can be taken. Here each subscriber must trust his twenty dollars to the management of some one, perhaps not of his own choice, yet, as the sum is definite. And not serious, its loss may not disturb his security, 
and he prefers to risk it for the prospective advantages to himself and his neighborhood. In entering his $20 into this combination he submits it to the control of others, but he submits nothing more, and if he is aware beforehand, that the business of all combinations must be conducted by delegated power, and if he is not compelled to submit to any conditions not contemplated beforehand, and if he can withdraw his investment at pleasure, then there is no violation of his natural liberty or sovereignty over his own, or, if he choose to make a permanent investment, and lay down all future control over it, for the sake of a prospective advantage, it is a surrender of so much of his property, not his liberty, to the control of others, but, it being a definite quantity, and the risks and conditions all being made known and voluntarily consented to beforehand, the consequences may not be serious to him, and, although he may discover, in the course of the business, that the principle is wrong, yet, he may derive ultimate advantage, under some circumstances, from so much combination, some may be willing to invest more and others less. If each one is himself the supreme judge at all times of the individual case in hand, and is free to act from his own individual estimate of the advantages to be derived to himself or others, as in the above instance, then the natural liberty of the individual is not invaded, but it is when the decision or will of others is made his rule of action, contrary to his views or inclination, that his legitimate liberty is violated. We eat prussic acid in a peach, another quantity of prussic acid is certain and sudden death. Let us learn to discriminate, to individualize our ideas, even of different quantities of the same thing. The above amount of combination may be harmless, indeed, it may give us a healthful proof that it is wrong in principle, and admonish us not to pursue it farther. But now let us contemplate another degree of combination, combination as the basis of society, involving all the great interests of man, his liberty, his person, his mind, his time, his labor, his food, the soil he rests upon, his property, his responsibilities to an indefinite extent, his security, the education and destinies of his children, the indefinite interests of his race. In such combinations, whether political or social, the different members can never be found always possessing the same views and feelings on all these subjects. Not even two persons can perform a piece of music together in order. unless one of them commences or leads individually, or, unless both agree to be governed by some third movement, which is an individuality. Two leaders cannot lead, the lead must be individual. Or confusion and discord will be the result. The same is true with regard to any combined movement. In political and social combinations, men have sought to mitigate the horrid abuses of despotism by diffusing the delegated power, but they have always purchased the relief at the expense of confusion. The experience of all the world has shown, that the business of such combinations cannot be conducted by the whole of its members, but that one or a few must be set apart to lead and manage the business of the combination, to the, power must be delegated just in proportion to the amount of business committed to their charge. These constitute the government of the combination, and to this government all must yield their individual sovereignty, or the combination cannot move one step. If their persons, their responsibilities, and all their interests are involved in the combination, as in communities of common property, all these must be entirely under the control of the government, whose judgment or will is the rule for all the governed, and the natural liberty or sovereignty of every member is entirely annihilated, and the government is as strong, as absolute as a government can be made, while the members are rendered as weak and as dependent on the governing few as they can be rendered, and consequently, their liberty and security are reduced to the lowest practicable degree. If only half of the interests of the individual are invested in the combination, then only half the quantity of government is required, and only half of the natural liberty of the members need to be surrendered but as this definite quantity cannot be measured and set apart from the other half, and as government once erected, either through the indefiniteness of the language in which the power is delegated or by other means, will steal the other half, there is no security, no liberty for mankind, but through the abandonment of combinations as the basis of society.
If governments originate in combined interests, and if government and liberty cannot exist together, then the solution of our problem demands that there be no combined interests to manage. All interests must be individualized, all responsibilities must be individual, before men can enjoy complete liberty or security, and before society can be completely harmonious. We can dispense with government only in proportion as we can reduce the amount of public business to be managed. This, then, is the movement for the restoration of the liberty of mankind, it is to disconnect, to individualize, rather than to combine or unite our interests. When one's person, his labor, his responsibilities, the soil he rests on, his food, his property, and all his interests are so disconnected, disunited from others, that he can control or dispose of these at all times, according to his own views and feelings, without controlling or disturbing others, and when his premises are sacred to himself, and his person is not approached, nor his time and attention taken up, against his inclination, then the individual may be said to be practically sovereign of himself, and all that constitutes or pertains to his individuality. No greater scope of liberty for every individual can be conceived, any less is not the greatest practicable amount of liberty, and will not supply the demand of our third proposition, 3. 4. Economy in the production and uses of wealth. The first and greatest source of economy, the richest mine of wealth ever worked by man, is, the division and exchange of labor. Where a man is so isolated from society as to be deprived of the advantages of division and exchange of labor, and has to supply all his own wants, like Robinson Crusoe, there is nothing to distinguish him from the savage. It is only in proportion as he can apply himself to one or a few pursuits, and exchange his products for the supply of all his wants, that he begins to emerge from the crudest state of existence, to surround himself with conveniences and luxuries, and to reduce the burden of his own labor. Were it not for the division and exchange of labor, everyone who used a needle would be obliged to make it. He or she must dig the ore, erect a furnace, convert the ore into iron, then into steel, and construct all the machinery and tools necessary to make the needles, and make all the tools required in those operations. As this would be impossible, we should be obliged to resort to such clothing as could be made without them, and were it not for the Division and exchange of labor in the production of the single article of needles, it is probable, that civilized society would still be clothed like the uncivilized. Division and exchange are naturally carried to a greater extent in cities than in the open country. This, probably, in part, explains the enigma of so many being sustained luxuriously in cities apparently almost without labor, while men in the country are always hard at work but rarely have things comfortable around them. Being so remote from division and exchange, they are obliged to supply many of their own wants without the ordinary means of doing it, without tools, without instruction, without practice, they must mend a gate, repair their harness, make their own shoes, and expend, perhaps, three times the labor that a workman would require in the same operations, and it is badly done at last. They must also have as many kinds of tools as the different operations demand, which it requires care to preserve and keep in order, and between all, their time and capital are frittered away to little purpose. Five hundred men thus scattered too remote from each other, or, from other causes being unable to procure the advantages of division and exchange, must have five hundred pairs of bench planes, and other tools for working wood, five hundred sets of shoemaking tools. 500 places and fixtures for working iron, and 500 equipments in every other branch of business in which they are obliged to dabble. Now, if these 500 men or families were within reach of each other, and each one were to apply himself to only one branch of business, and all should exchange with each other, each one would require only one set of tools, and one trade, instead of 30 or 40, his work would be well done instead of ill done, and if exchanges were equal, the wants of each would be well supplied, at perhaps, the cost of one-fourth the labor that is now required to supply one-half their wants in an inferior manner. If such are the enormous advantages of division and exchange, how can we account for the fact, that so large portions of all countries being deprived of them, and that even in cities division if not carried out, excepting in a very few branches of manufacture.
I attribute this barbarous condition of the economies chiefly to two causes. First, the practice of making value the standard of price, asking for a thing just what it will bring. Just balances the motives of the purchaser, so, that a man wanting a pair of shoes, being asked as much as he would give for them, rather than go without them, makes him form the habit of going without whenever he can, or of making them himself even at a disadvantage. Whereas, on the contrary, if he could always get them for that amount of his own labor which they cost an expert workman, he could have no motive to do without them, nor to spend three times as much labor in making them himself. The same cause and the same reasons ramify into all our supplies. A wants a barrel of flour, and goes to the holder, but he is not anxious to sell. A report of short crops induces him to think that there will not be a supply for the demand, it will be wanted more by and by, and he can get more as want or suffering increases, so he does not get the flour, no exchange of flour takes place yet, he waits, goes again, he is told that flour has risen since yesterday at twelve o'clock, he must pay more than usual, and the price is set at what the holder thinks it will bring, but a, knowing that one fluctuation follows another, thinks he will wait till the price falls, so no exchange of flour takes place yet. A has still no flour, and thus it is with everything else, the same elements ramify into all our exchanges, and derange all our efforts to obtain supplies. Making value, or, what a thing will bring, the limit of its price, stagnates exchange, and prevents our wants from being supplied. Now, if it were not a part of the present system to get a price according to the degree of want or suffering of the community, there would long since have been some arrangement made to adapt the supply to the demand. This, even in the present wretched jumble of accidents, would, to a great extent, soften some of the most hideous features of our cannibal commerce. In society where even the first element of order had made its way, to the intellects of men, there would be some point at which all would continually make known their wants, as far as they could anticipate them, and put them in a position to be supplied, and all who wanted employment would know where to look for it, and the supply would be adapted to the demand. We should not then have all the flour carried out of the country where it was raised, so that none could be had, as at this moment while I am writing, and carried a thousand miles in anticipation of higher prices. This rush of flour has exceeded the demand, Prices have fallen, 1,200 barrels have spoiled in one man's hands, and 2,000 barrels are on their way back to the place of production. Where, after having been stored and booked, and draped and shipped to New Orleans, and they're unshipped and drayed, and stored and booked, and waiting for a demand. It is again drayed and shipped, and brought back to be unshipped, drayed, and stored and booked, and sold, half spoiled to its original producers, for all its first cost, with all these expenses added, and as much more as the holders, can get. This is the economy of our present profit-making commerce. The adaptation of the supply to the demand, although it is continually governing the bodies of men, seems never to have made its way into their intellects, or they would have made it the governing principle of their arrangements. It is this which prompts almost every action of life, not only of men, but other animals, insects, all animated nature. All man's pursuits originate in his efforts to supply some of his wants, either physical, mental, or moral, even our intellectual commerce is unconsciously governed by this great principle, whenever it is harmonious and beneficial, and it is discordant and depreciating where it is not so regulated. An answer to a question is but a supply to a demand. Advice, when wanted, is acceptable, but never otherwise, commands are never in this order, and produce nothing but disorder. The sovereignty of the individual must correct this. Almost every movement of every animal is from na nature's promptings toward the supply of some of its wants. Nay, more, if it is wounded, there is naturally an action toward the formation of new skin, or new parts to supply the deficiency created. The same principle runs even into the vegetable creation. The bark of a tree being torn away, 
nature goes to work to supply the demand thus produced, with new bark, which otherwise never would have occupied that place. Even a pumpkin vine having run too far to draw nourishment from its original starting point, strikes down new roots, to draw a supply of nourishment necessary to its progress. Had the combined wisdom of any country ever equaled that of a pumpkin vine, that country would have had some arrangement for adapting the supply to the demand. But this will never be, while speculations are made by throwing the demand and supply out of their natural proportions, or while value. Instead of cost, is made the limit of price. This false principle of price, in addition to all its direct iniquity, stagnates exchanges, interrupts or stops supplies, and involves everything in uncertainty and confusion, discourages arrangement and order, and prevents division and exchange. Another great obstacle to division and exchange is the lack of some principle by which to settle the prices, or which would itself settle them harmoniously, instead of the disgusting process of bargaining in every little transaction, which is so repugnant to good sense and good feeling that the best citizens are often induced to do without conveniences, or undertake to supply themselves to great disadvantage rather than enter into the degrading warfare which generally attends our pecuniary commerce. They will also afford to others little accommodations gratuitously for the same reason, these lay the receiver under indefinite obligations, one of the worst forms of slavery. Gratuitous labor must necessarily be limited, and thousands of exchanges of great value, but little cost, would immensely increase the comforts of all parties, where cost, as a principle, measured and settled the price in every transaction, without words, without disturbing our social feelings and self-respect. Another great obstacle to the development of this branch of economy is the uncertainty, the insecurity of every business. Men dare not make investments for carrying on business. Another great obstacle to extensive division of labor and rapid and easy ex was this representative, but it is not. Men dare not make investments for carrying on everything. All labor men dare not make investments for carrying on. Men dare not make investments was this representative but it is not, each representative we can always care. Men dare not make investments for carrying on business to the best advantage while the markets for their products are unsteady, where prices rise at 8 o'clock and fall at 12. If prices were equitably adjusted by the cost principle, we should know, from year to year, from age to age very nearly, the prices of everything, all labor being equally rewarded according to its cost, there would be no destructive competition markets would be steady, then we might subdivide the different parts of manufacturers to any extent that the demand would justify at any time, and be safe, secure, and society would know the immense wealth to be derived from the division of labor. Another great obstacle to extensive division of labor, and rapid and easy exchanges, seems to be the want of the means of affecting exchanges. We cannot carry our property about us for the purpose of exchanging. If we could do this, and give one thing for another at once, and thus settle every transaction, such a thing as money, or a circulating medium, never would have been known, but, as we cannot carry flour, shoes, carpentering, brickwork, storekeeping, etc., about us to exchange for what we want, we require something which represents these, which representative we can always carry with us. This representative of property should be our circulating medium. Theorists have said that money was this representative, but it is not. A dollar represents nothing whatever but itself nor can it be made to. At no time is it any demand on anyone for any quantity of any kind of property or labor whatever. At one time a dollar will procure two bushels of potatoes, at another time three bushels, at another four, and different quantities of different persons at the same time. It has no definite value at any time, nor if it had, would its value qualify it for a circulating medium, but, on the contrary, its value and its cost being inseparably united with its use as a representative, disqualifies all money for acting the part of a circulating medium, it should have but one quality, one individual, definite purpose, that of standing in the place of the thing represented, as a miniature represents a person. 
Money represents robbery, banking, gambling, swindling, counterfeiting, etc. As much as it represents property, it has a value that varies with every individual that uses it and changes as often as it is used. A picture that would represent at one time a man, at another a monkey, and then a gourd, would be just as legitimate and fit for a portrait, as common money is fit for a circulating medium. We want a circulating medium that is a definite representative of a definite quantity of property, and nothing but a representative, so that when we cannot make direct equivalent exchanges of property, we can supply the deficiency with its definite representative, which will stand in its place. And this should not have any reference to the value of property, but only to its cost, so that if I get a bushel of wheat of you, I give you the representative of shoemaking, with which you should be able to obtain from the shoemaker as much labor as you bestowed on the wheat, cost for cost in equivalent quantities, and to effect these exchanges with facility, each one must always have a plenty of this representative on hand, or be able to make it on the occasion, and so adapt the supply of the circulating medium to the demand for it, a problem that never has yet been solved by any financiers in the world, nor ever will be while value is taken into account of price. The remark is common, that, if money was plenty we would purchase many things that we cannot for want of it. Here, no exchange takes place that otherwise would, and division will always be in proportion to exchange or sales. Where there is no circulating medium, there cannot be much exchange or division. On the other hand, where every one has a plenty of the circulating medium always at hand, exchanges and division of labor would not be limited for want of money. A note given by each individual for his own labor, estimated by its cost, is perfectly legitimate and competent for all the purposes of a circulating medium. It is based upon the bone and muscle, the manual powers, the talents, and resources, the property, and property producing powers of the whole people, the soundest of all foundations, and is a circulating medium of the only kind that ever ought to have been issued. The only objection to it is, that it would immediately abolish all the great money transactions of the world, all banks and banking operations, all stock jobbing, money corporations, and money movements, all systems of finance, all systems of national policy and commercial corruption, abolish all distinctions of rich and poor, compel everyone to live and enjoy at his own cost, and would contribute largely to restore the world to order, peace, and harmony. Boarding houses, hotels, etc., having no principle for the government of prices but whatever they can get, in the cannibal competition of society, get whatever they can, and their inmates are only those who have no other homes. If cost were made the limit of price, as economy is in favor of one set of preparations for great numbers, the cost being less in proportion to numbers, it would immediately become the interest of every one wanting board to cooperate with all others, to afford every facility in their power to get the greatest practicable number of boarders for such an establishment, and to afford every convenience, every facility for reducing the labor and trouble of conducting it, and each one doing this. Through self-interest, to reduce the cost of his own fare, would be promoting equally the interest of every other boarder, here would be CO, operation, but no combination. They need have no compact with each other. The individual. who conducted the house, would be the only person with whom any contract need be made. Five hundred persons thus accommodated with five times better fare than common boarding houses can now afford, would employ but one kitchen, instead of a hundred kitchens, perhaps five cooks, instead of a hundred, and the cost of board to each would, probably, not exceed one-fifth of that of keeping a private kitchen for five persons. Families seeing. This would probably prefer such quarters, at least at meal times, and thus relieve the females of the family, from the dull, millhorse drudgery to which they otherwise are irretrievably doomed. One person to keep a dairy in good order, instead of fifty cows being scattered among fifty families, with fifty boys or men to hunt and drive them, badly housed, badly fed, and badly treated in the hurry of other domestic duties, 
is an arrangement that would naturally result from the economy that each would derive from the cost principle. A washing establishment conducted on the cost principle would exhibit one of the most necessary divisions of labor and relieve the housekeepers from the most irksome and repugnant of all their duties. The same principle and motives being brought to bear upon schools, the different branches of mechanism, and all social arrangements, would work in a similar manner, each in the pursuit of his own interest promoting the interests of all others. Machinery being made and worked on the cost principle, every one would be equally benefited by its construction and use, the more there was at work, the more would the burden of labor be reduced to all. If it threw a certain set out of employment, they would turn immediately to other employments, and thus reduce the labor still to be performed by hand. Land being bought and sold on the cost principle, would be open to them at almost a nominal price. Board and clothing being obtained at cost, all arts, trades, and mysteries being communicated for an equivalent of the labor of communicating them, and the rewards of all labor being equal according to its cost, a report of the demand being always accessible, so that they could know what to turn to, and where to find instruction in any art, trade, or science, and a market for their products at a full, equivalent. Price, machinery might then be introduced without any limits but their wants, with benefits to all, with injury to none. And who shall measure the yet untold economies which might then result from machinery? I have said. Without any limits but our wants, because an immense number of inventions are now brought out which are no improvements at all upon existing modes, and the country is overrun, and inventions disgraced by a surfeit of the productions of overstimulated stupidity, for no other purpose than to escape from unpaid labor and the punishments of poverty. The want or demand for a machine would furnish the only reasonable motive for its construction, and an equivalent in labor and cost of materials would be the legitimate compensation to its inventor. This would afford no more inducements to invent machinery than to pursue anything else that might be in demand, all things being equally paid, there would be no temptation to invent machinery that was not wanted, but the supply would be harmoniously adapted to the demand or wants of society. It is no uncommon occurrence that food, clothing, etc., for which thousands are suffering, are destroyed to prevent prices from falling too low for the interests of speculators. To save these from this kind of destruction, is the particular province of the cost principle, which, while it destroys speculators themselves, delights in passing supplies from producer to consumer at the cheapest equivalent rates. Physicians who can get $50 per day, while the most useful labor is paid only 50 cents, cannot be expected to get us well while it would stop their income and drive them to an unpaid labor, but $50 a day will maintain them by working one day in 50, or maintain 50 times as many doctors as the demand requires. The cost principle will adapt the supply to the demand, and destroy the temptation to keep us sick for the sake of the profit of it. Swarms of lawyers, office holders, and office seekers cry. Swarms of lawyers, office holders, and office seekers crowd the ranks of useless consumers, whose chief business it is to contrive means of keeping up the state of things by which they are exempt from unpaid labor and enjoy a few of the privileges of freemen. Individualizing all business, committing none to the management of government, and conducting all our business equitably with our fellow men, on the cost principle, will sweep away all demand for them, will compel them to assist in reducing rather than increasing the burden of labor, and paying all labor by equivalence will change even their condition for a better. Hordes of robbers, pirates, bankers, speculators, thieves, gamblers, pickpockets, swindlers, etc., who are driven into anything to live, and to escape abused labor at starvation prices, may suddenly become useful citizens, when labor is properly paid, and assist in reducing rather than increasing the burden of labor. When the door to all trades and occupations is thrown open, when the demands or wants of society are made known, when anyone can turn at any time to a choice of employment which will find a market at equivalent prices, 
and when any one may live on two or three hours labor per day, where can any one find a motive to be a fungus upon society? When we contemplate the immense piles of materials and mechanism in church paraphernalia, the armies of preachers and theological impostors, their typesetters, printers, their emissaries in every nook and corner of the world, all unproductive, and only professing to counteract the vices of the present system, we see in these reasons enough for its total demolition. A direct and equitable exchange between the present producers would entirely cut them off from the means of existence. If it be true that the demand for these grow out of the vices of the present social state, these being cured, their occupation will be at an end, and their transition to the productive and self-supporting class will not only put a stop to their excessive, wasteful consumption, but will immensely reduce the still remaining burden of labor. Controversialists, and all who are employed by them, whether moral, religious, or political, are all engaged in propping up, in pulling down, in repairing or counteracting the natural action of existing social elements. Their equitable and harmonious adjustment would relieve us of all these taxes upon our time and labor, which would be no small item of economy. Everything being bought and sold for the greatest profit the holder can get, it becomes his interest to purchase everything as cheap as possible, the cheaper he purchases the more profit he makes. This is the origin of the present horrid system of grinding and destructive competition among all producers, who are thus prompted to underwork each other. Thus, too, it is, that there is scarcely any article of food, clothing, tools, or medicines, that is fit for use, that we are always purchasing to throw away, to be cheated out of our money and time, and be disappointed in our supplies. Responsibility rests nowhere. The vendor does not make them, but imports them from those beyond the reach of responsibility. Why is everything imported, even shoes, tools, woolen and cotton cloths? For profit. It is because things are not sold for their cost, but for whatever the holder can get. Were cost made the limit of price, the vendor of goods would have no particular motive to purchase them at the very lowest prices that he could grind out from manufacturers, and they would, therefore, have no motive to underwork and destroy each other. There would be no more of each than enough to supply the demand, no motive to import what could be made with equal advantage at home, and the manufacturer would be obliged to assume the individual responsibility of his work, because where profit-making did not stand in the way, the merchant would not otherwise purchase of him, and where land was bought and sold at cost, every man of business would own the premises where the work was done, and could not easily run away from the character of it. And this must be kept good, or another would immediately take his place. Here, then, in the cost principle, is the means of rendering competition not only harmless, but a great regulating and adjusting power. And under its mighty influence, should we not only escape national ruin from the excessive importation of worthless articles, but should have good ones always insured, by their manufacturers being within reach of tangible responsibility. The scramble for unlimited profits in trade being annihilated by equitable exchanges between nations, the imports and exports would be naturally self-regulating, and limited to such as were mutually beneficial, and each would have a cooperating interest in the prosperity of the other. When this takes place, the armies and navies now employed in consuming and destroying, will be compelled to turn to producing, at least whatever they consume, and thus take off another crushing load from downtrodden labor. Cost being made the limit of price, no bargaining, higgling, and chaffering, so disgusting to every one, will stand in the way of a direct purchase at once of whatever any one wants. The price will be known from year to year, and will be paid without asking it, and the time now consumed in higgling and bargain-making will be harmlessly or usefully employed. Wars are, probably, the greatest of all destroyers of property, and they originate chiefly in two routes. First, for direct or indirect plunder, secondly, for the privileges of governing. Direct plunder will cease when men can create property with less trouble than they can invade their fellow creatures. Indirect plunder will cease with making cost the limit of price, 
thus cutting off all profits of trade. The privileges of governing will cease when men take all their business out of national or other combinations, manage it individually, deal equitably with each other, and leave no governing to be done. Every one having full pay for his labor can afford the luxuries of mechanism, commerce, and science. Each exchanging with the other for an equivalent as a settled principle, there could remain no inducement for a man, or a country, or a nation, to attempt to supply all their own wants to disadvantage, but, as under cooperative interests, every one would gain in proportion to the division of labor, this great element of economy would be carried to the very highest state of perfection. These are a few of the items of economy that appear as necessary consequences of equity among men, others will suggest themselves to each mind as the subject is studied. V. To open the way to each individual to land and all other natural wealth. By natural wealth is here meant all wealth, so far as it is not the result of human labor. The cost principle being made the limit of price, opens all this wealth to every one at once. Land being bought and sold on this principle, passes from owner to owner with no farther additions to prime cost than the labor of buying and selling it. If improvements C have been made upon it, their cost only being paid, makes the natural wealth free and accessible to all without price. In this manner simple equity would free, not only public, but private lauds, from the trammels of profit-making. If it could not be sold for profit, it would not be bought for speculation and, it cannot be sold for profit in competition with those who will buy and sell it for an equivalent. Therefore, here is a power in simple equity which is perfectly irresistible to free all lands, and to keep them free, a power by which one person alone can open the land for miles around him, and make it accessible to all who require it. No power on earth can prevent him, and he can do it without sacrifice to himself. Metals and the earth are natural wealth, and the cost principle would pass them to consumers at the cost of labor in digging, preparing, and delivering them. The inventor of a machine may put wheels, weights, and levers together in a certain relation to each other, which may produce great and valuable results to the public, but this value is no measure for its compensation. The cost to him of putting them together is his legitimate ground of price, while the qualities of a circle, the power of a lever, and the gravitating tendency of a weight are natural wealth, and are lightly the property of all, and cost being made the limit of price, makes them accessible to all without price. Certain articles of medicine compounded together may save life, and their value in this case would equal that of the life saved, upon this principle a dose of pills would be worth, perhaps, ten thousand dollars, but this is no reason for such a price. The only rational price is an equivalent for the labor of procuring the articles, putting them together, and the contingent expenses of vending them. The rest depends on the inherent natural qualities of the ingredients, which are natural wealth, and should be freely accessible to all without price, and this results from cost being made the limit of their price. A teacher of music may communicate the principles of composition, which may be of great value to the receiver, but this value is derived chiefly from the inherent qualities and relations of sounds to each other, upon which they depend for their effect, and which are not of man's creating, nor has man any right to make them the ground of price in communicating them to others. If the teacher of music be paid for his labor in an equivalent only, then the natural wealth inherent in musical elements becomes accessible to all without price. The same may be said of all sciences, arts, trades, mysteries, and all other subjects of our commerce, whether pecuniary, intellectual, or moral. One may devote his time and labor upon an intellectual production, but who can measure its value? This depends chiefly upon the new truths developed or communicated. It is its cost only that can be equitably made the ground of price, and when this is refunded by an equal amount of labor, equally repugnant or disagreeable, and equally costly in its contingencies, the writer is legitimately compensated, the rest is natural wealth. 
The cost principle draws a distinct line of discrimination between this and the wealth produced by labor, awarding to every one equivalence for cost, but for cost only, while all natural wealth is thus rendered free and accessible to all without price, which solves the fifth proposition of our social problem. 6. To make the interests of all to cooperate with each other, instead of clashing with and destroying each other. If cost is made the limit of price, everyone becomes interested in reducing cost, by bringing in all the economies, all the facilities to their aid. But, on the contrary, if cost does not govern the price, but everything is priced at what it will bring, there are no such cooperating interests. This will be self-evident to many, but to some minds a few illustrations may be necessary, in addition to what has already been said relative to boarding houses, etc. If I am to have my supply of flour at cost, then, any facility I can afford to the wheat grower, reduces the cost to me, and as it does the same for all who have any portion of the wheat, I am promoting all their interests while pursuing my own. If I know that planting in drills produces more with less labor, it is my interest to communicate it, and have experiments instituted. If I can construct a machine to save labor in planting, cultivating, harvesting, or grinding, it is for my interest, and that of all others, to cooperate in getting it into operation. If I see the fences down, exposing the wheat to the depredations of cattle, it is my interest, and that of all others, to have the breach repaired as soon as possible, because all contingent losses become part of the cost. Now, if the wheat were not T.O.B. sold to us at cost, but at whatever it would bring. According to our necessities, then none of us would have any interest in affording facilities, repairing breaches, nor in any other way cooperating with the producer of it. The same motive would act in the production, preservation, and use of everything. One or a few individuals may desire instruction in music. If the teacher set his price at whatever he thinks he can make the students give, he may prevent them from making the attempt and keep himself out of business, but if the cost of his labor be divided among the class, it immediately becomes the interest of each to get as many as possible, thereby reducing the cost to each, and the same would be seen in every operation of this description, and the same with nations as with individuals. If the products of machinery were sold at cost, it would then be for the interest of everyone to afford any facilities in his power toward its construction and its operation, and in thus reducing cost for his own advantage, he would be equally promoting the interest of everyone who used the products of the machine. Thus, then, upon the principle of cost being made the limit of price, is the interest of all made to so operate, but not to combine with, the interest of each. Thus is solved the great problem of the individual good harmonized with the public good. Thus does simple equity outstrip the sagacity and the genius of man, and work out for him the great problem of society, without the destruction of liberty. In the preceding pages I have treated of the first six propositions of our problem, and endeavored to show that the first, the just reward of labor, must be worked out by making cost the limit of price. That the security of person and property demands the operation of this principle, together with the admission of the right of sovereignty in every individual. That liberty demands the sovereignty of the individual. That the economies would naturally result from the operations of cost being made the limit of price. That, by the same means, land, and all other natural wealth, would be legitimately accessible to all. That by making cost the limit of price, the interests of all mankind would cooperate for mutual benefit, but I have deferred the consideration of the seventh and last proposition, withdrawal of the elements of discord, and the establishment of general harmony, to the following division, as this is rather the result of the working of all these elements together. I have treated each principal division of our subject separately and abstractedly, in order that the mind of the reader might be the more concentrated upon one individual element at a time, and not have his attention confused and weakened by a too close connection of different parts at first. But now that these may have become so familiar as not to require exclusive attention to either, 
I propose to associate these elements of new society together, in their natural and practical order, and illustrate more fully their adaptation to their proposed ends. These elements are, first, individuality, second, the sovereignty of each individual, third, cost the limit of price, fourth, a circulating medium which shall be a definite representative of labor, fifth, the adaptation of the supply to the demand or wants. I would suggest to the reader to refer continually to the marginal references, and to study and familiarize himself with each proposition that may be there marked, to compare these means with the ends to be attained, and to exercise his individual judgment with regard to their adaptation to the solution of the great questions which involve the deepest interests of every one, and which can no longer be deferred with safety to any. Part 3. The Application. Elements of New Society. The first step to be taken by any number of persons in these practical movements appears to be, that each individual or head of a family, should consider his or her present wants, and what he can give in exchange, with a view to have them recorded in a book kept for that purpose. As soon as a movement is made by any one to this effect, a book will be wanted as a record of this report of wants, and supplies. At this point, when this is evidently wanted enough to justify it in the estimation of any individual, he or she can furnish and keep such a book upon his or her individual responsibility. If the cost of this is sufficient to justify a demand for remuneration, the keeper of the book can make this demand, according to the labor bestowed in each case, or otherwise, as he or she shall decide, the voice of the majority having nothing to do with it. We will now suppose that the wants of twenty individuals are recorded in one column of a book, and what they can supply in another column, and in another, the price per hour which each demands for his or her labor. These become the fundamental data for operations. Everyone wishing to take some part in practical operations, now has before him in this report of wants, the business to be done. It will immediately be seen that land is indispensable, and must be had before any other step can be taken to advantage. Someone seeing this want, after consulting the wishes or demands of the co-operators, proceeds on his individual estimate of this demand, at his own risk, and at his own cost, to purchase or otherwise procure land to commence upon, lays it out in lots to suit the demand, and sells them to the co-operators at the ultimate cost, including contingent expenses of money and labor in buying and selling. The difference in the price of a house lot thus bought and sold, compared with its price when sold for its value, will be found sufficient to make the difference between every one having a home upon the earth, instead of one half of men and women being homeless. We will now suppose the lots purchased and paid for by each one who is to occupy them. They will want to consult continually together, in order to cooperate with each other's movements, this will require or demand a place for meetings. As soon as this want is apparent, then is the time for someone to estimate this want, and take it on himself individually to provide a room, and see himself remunerated according to cost, which cannot fail to be satisfactory to all in proportion as they are convinced that cost is the limit of his demands, which he can always prove by keeping an account of expenses and receipts, open at all times to the most public inspection that, see note A, in appendix. At this public room, provided each one is properly preserved from the ordinary fetters of organization, all can confer with each other relative to their intended movements. If one has a suggestion to make to the whole body, he can find listeners in proportion to the interest that each one feels in his proposition, and a decent respect to the right of every one to listen if he chooses. Will prevent disturbances from the indifferent, just in proportion as the right of sovereignty in each individual is made a familiar element of surrounding opinion. If one wished to propose a movement upon the land on a certain day, after having made his proposals, every one should consider himself or herself the supreme law for himself or herself, and not to permit any vote of the whole body to rise above his or her individual estimate of their own convenience and advantage, nor to decide how far he or she should disregard either for the interest of others. But having listened to the wants and sentiments of others, as long as to him or her seems good, let 
each be the supreme deciding power for himself, but not for others. When business commences, the estimates of prices must commence, and the circulating medium will be wanted. For instance, if the keeper of the room for meetings has expended a hundred hours of his labor in keeping it in order, etc., and if there are twenty who have regularly or substantially received the benefits of it, then five hours equivalent labor is due from each. This calls for the circulating medium, and he may receive from the carpenter, the blacksmith, the shoemaker, the tailoress, the washerwoman, etc., their labor notes, promising a certain number of hours of their definite kinds of labor. The keeper of the room is now equipped with a circulating medium with which he can procure the services of either of the persons at a price which is agreed and settled on beforehand, which will obviate all disturbance in relation to prices, he holds a currency whose product to him will not be less at the report of scarcity, nor rise at twelve o'clock. From year to year, he can get a certain definite quantity of labor for the labor he performed, which cannot be said, nor made to be true, with regard to any money the world has ever known. An ex extraordinary feature presents itself in this stage of the operations of equitable commerce. When the washerwoman comes to set her price according to the cost or hardness of the labor compared with others, it is found that its price exceeds that of the ordinary labor of men. Of course, the washerwoman must have more per hour than the vendor of house lots or the inventor of pills. To deny this, is to deny the very foundation of the whole superstructure. We must admit the claims of the hardest labor to the highest reward, or we deny our own rights, extinguish the little light we have obtained, and throw everything back into confusion. What is the obstacle to the honest admission and free action of this principle? What would be the ultimate result of carrying it thoroughly out, and giving to everyone what equity demands? It would result in surrounding everyone with an abundance, with peace, liberty, harmony, and security, and reduce the labor of each to two or three hours per day. See Note B, in Appendix In a movement upon a new location, it would be well for every one to be guarded against being swept along by the mere current of others' movements, without seeing how he is to be sustained in his new position. The larger the purchases of lumber, provisions, etc., at once, the cheaper will the prices be to each receiver upon the cost principle, and these economics, together with the social sympathies, will offer the natural inducements for an associated movement. But there is great danger that oven these inducements will urge many into such movements prematurely, we cannot be too cautious not to run before the demand. Let no one move to an equity village, till he has thoroughly consulted the demand for his labor at that place, and satisfied himself individually, that he can sustain himself individually. See Caution, Appendix. Previously to any movement upon a new locality, it will probably be perceived that a boarding house would be necessary to accommodate the few pioneers until they could build for themselves. Instead of making this the business of the whole association, some one individual perceiving this want can make it his business to provide one adapted to the demand by ascertaining how many persons are likely to require it and what style of living they prefer. If these persons are satisfied that cost will be honestly made the limit of the price of their accommodations, then every one will be interested in reducing this cost, by lending such articles of furniture as he can spare, by communicating anything that will enable the keeper to purchase to advantage, and to transport provisions and materials, and to get up the establishment with as little cost as possible. But during all these operations every one's interest will be distinctly individual. The future keeper of the house has the deciding power individually in everything relative to it, and each boarder makes his contract with the keeper. But as no combination takes place, no vote of any majority is called upon until the borders become so closely connected that each individual cannot exercise his individual taste, when all cannot be gratified, then it is, and not till then, that the will of the majority is the best practicable resort of the keeper, but he must not surrender his individual prerogative of management, even in this case, or all will be confusion. When this calls for too great a sacrifice from any one, 
the remedy will be found only in disconnection from that boarding house, and a resort to another more congenial to his taste, or to private accommodations. In such case, there being no combination to consult, none but the one person is put to inconvenience, no other persons are disturbed. In this boarding house, if the keeper of it keeps an account of all his expenditures of money and labor, open at all times to the inspection of his boarders, and divides the cost. Among them, he cannot be charged with penurious management for his own profit, nor can any of the ordinary dissatisfaction from this cause disturb the general harmony. This arrangement is imperfect, inasmuch as there is more or less of united interests involved in it. The perfect form, excepting in the principle of fixing prices, is found in the eating, houses in the cities where any individual can go at any time, and get any particular fare that suits his individual demands. He gratifies his own tastes at his own individual cost, and is not involved in expenses for others, and therefore there is no collision between any parties. This perfect arrangement is practicable only in circles large enough to sustain it. In all business where money is used, it has been found necessary to keep it entirely separate from labor, receiving money, in the exchanges, for that which costs money, and labor for that which costs labor. The union of money with labor has not been the great fundamental error. We now divorce, disconnect, individualize them, and in all running accounts have one column for money, and another for labor, two distinct accounts, and two distinct currencies, until a rational circulating medium can supplant money altogether. It will now be found necessary to ascertain the amount of labor required in the production of all those things which we expect to exchange. This naturally suggests itself to each one in his own business, and if all bring in their estimates, either at public meetings, or have them hung up in the public room, they become the necessary data for each individual to act upon. It is this open, daylight, free comparison of prices, which naturally regulates them, while land, and all trades, arts, and sciences, will be thrown open to every one, so that he or she can immediately abandon an unpaid labor, which will preserve them from being ground by competition below equivalents. If a sets his estimate of the making of a certain kind of coat at 50 hours, and B sets his at 30 hours, the price per hour, and the known qualities of workmanship being the same in both, it is evident that A could get no business while B could supply the demand. It is evident that A has not given an honest estimate, or, that he is in the wrong position for the general economy, but he can immediately consult the report of the demand, and select some other business for which he may be better adapted. If he concludes to make shoes, his next step is to get instruction in this branch, he refers to the column of supplies, and ascertains the name and price per hour of the shoemakers, he goes to one of them, makes his arrangement for instruction, then provides himself with a room and tools, sends for his instructor, pays him according to the time employed, and becomes a shoemaker. Is this thought impracticable? See note on apprenticeships, in appendix. The new shoemaker, having paid his instructor for his labor, has the proceeds of it, together with his own, at his own disposal and if these be sold for equivalents, he will find his new apprenticeship quite self-sustaining. The same course will have to be pursued with regard to all trades and professions. The supply must be adapted to the demand, which demand should be continually made known at a particular place, by each one who wants anything, while those who want employment will know where to apply for it, and what they can get in exchange, and if one is not already qualified to supply some portion of the demand, he will be obliged to qualify himself or fall back upon the land, and supply all his own wants, and be deprived of the advantages of division and exchange, or he must manufacture some article that will sell abroad. We have now progressed far into practical operations without any combination or unity of interests. Every interest and every responsibility being kept strictly individual, no legislation has been necessary. There has been no demand for artificial organization. There being no public business to manage, no government has been necessary, and therefore no surrender of the natural liberty has been required. Now, let us imagine one small item of united interests, and trace its consequences. We will suppose that A and B get a horse in partnership, to transport their baggage to the new location. The horse is taken sick, A proposes a medicine, which B thinks would be fatal, 
neither party has the power to lay down his own opinion and take up that of the other. These are parts of the individualities of each, which are perfectly natural, and, therefore, uncontrollable. A brings arguments and facts to sustain his opinion, B does the same, still they differ, and the horse is growing worse. What is to be done? One dislikes to proceed contrary to the views of the other, and both remain inactive for the same reason. There is no deciding power, and the horse is growing worse. What can they do but call a third party to act in behalf of both? To this third party, both commit the management of the horse and surrender their right of decision. This third party is government. This government cannot possibly decide both ways, and either A or B, or both, remain fearful and dissatisfied. The disturbance now extends itself to the third party, producing a social disease in addition to that of the horse. This is in the wrong direction. We must take another course, retrace our steps. Look into causes, and we shall find the wrong in the unity of interests, disunite these, let A own the horse individually, then, if he is sick, A has the deciding power, listens to such counsel as he judges useful, and then proceeds to treat the horse. If the horse dies, a takes on himself the cost of his own decisions and acts, and the social harmony remains undisturbed. To be perfectly harmonious, all interests must be perfectly individual. Those who are most averse to collision with others, will find this an invaluable truth. Natural individualities admonish us not to be dogmatical on this or any other subject, but to be careful not to construct any institutions which require rigid adherence to any man-made rule system, or dogma of any kind, to leave every one free to make any application, or no application, of any and all principles proposed, and to make any qualification or exception to them which he or she may incline to make, always deciding and acting at his or her own cost, but not at the cost of others. If the horse, in the above instance, should die under A's decision and treatment, while B held an interest in him, then A decides and acts partly at the cost of B, which is wrong and discordant. Let us now examine the motive for this partnership interest. Is it for economy? We have that secured in the operation of the cost principle, and, therefore, united interest is unnecessary. Under the partnership interest, A and B would each have half the labor of the horse, and would bear half of his expenses. If cost were made the limit of price, and A owned him individually, and should let him work for B half of the time, the price would be half of his expenses, exactly the same result aimed at by the united interests. The difference is only that the one mode paralyzes action, is embarrassing and discordant, and, therefore, wrong, while the other admits the freest action, works equitably toward both parties, is perfectly harmonious, and, therefore, right. Again, let any laws, rules, regulations, constitutions, or any other articles of association be drawn out by the most acute minds, and be adopted by the whole. As soon as action commences, it will be found that the compact entered into becomes differently interpreted. We have no power to interpret language alike, but we have agreed to agree. New circumstances now occur, different, different from those contemplated in the compact. New expedients are to be resorted to, language is the only medium of communication and this is variously interpreted, two or more interpretations of the same language neutralize each other, an opinion expressed, is misunderstood, and requires correction, the correction contains words subject to a greater or less extent of meaning than the speaker intended, these require qualification. The qualification is variously understood, and requires explanation, the explanations require qualifications to infinity. Different opinions and expedients are now offered, all of which partake of the same elements of confusion, counter-opinions rise up on all sides, new expedients are proposed, all subject to various interpretations and appreciations, all requiring explanations and qualifications, and these, in their turn, demand qualifications and explanations. Different estimates are formed of the best expedients, but there is no liberty to differ. All must conform to the articles of compact or organization, 
the meaning of which can never be determined. Opinions, arguments, expedients, interests, hopes, fears, persons, and personalities, all mingle in one astounding confusion. All order is destroyed, all harmony has changed to discord. What is the origin of all this? It is the different interpretations of the same language, and the difference in the occasions of its applications, where there is not liberty to differ. A deep, seated, unseen, indestructible, inalienable. Individuality, ever active, unconquered, and unconquerable, is always directly at war with every demand for uniformity or conformity of thoughts and feelings. We ask again, what is to be done? As we cannot divest ourselves or events of natural individualities, there is but one remedy, this is, to avoid all necessity for artificial organizations, which necessity is founded in united interests. One person becoming security for another, produces a unity of interest that infringes the liberty of one, and often destroys the harmony of both. If C becomes security for D, then C has an interest and a right to a voice in all D's movements and expenditures until this connected interest is at an end. As natural individualities will probably compel them to differ in opinions of business, and matters of convenience and taste, the ease and security of C, and the harmony of both, are at least in danger, while C is involved in D's movements or expenditures. Dissolve this united interest, let D act upon his own individual responsibility, at his own cost, and he can then, and not till then, be the law unto himself. Exactly the same reasons apply against one person being in debt to another, and it is only by settling every transaction in the time of it, either by equivalence or their representative, such as the labor note, that the liberty, peace, and security of all parties can be preserved. Running accounts between any two persons are liable to be erroneous, from omissions and mistakes which are entirely beyond the control of the best intentions, but errors from these causes cannot be distinguished from those of design. All these are elements of uncomfortableness and discord, which those who value social harmony will avoid, by making every transaction an individual one, settling each in the time of it, when all its peculiarities are fresh in the minds of both parties. Once being settled to the satisfaction of both, nothing is left to the memory or the indefinite guess, work of the future, which is almost sure to produce dissatisfaction to one or both parties. A still more subtle, and more serious invasion of the rights of property, the natural liberty, and social harmony, is constantly at work in the form of indefinite obligations. If A lend B a hammer, it may be of great value to B, but no price is set upon it, this is considered a neighborly accommodation, and common morality says, neighbors should accommodate each other. The next day A applies to B for the loan of his favorite horse. B wishes to train his horse in a particular manner and knows that he cannot do this, if different people use him, besides, he wants to use him, or he wants him to rest, and no compensation is offered by A as an inducement. He evidently makes the request on the ground that, neighbors should accommodate each other, and on this ground B loses all proper control over his horse, and, on the same principle, over everything that he possesses which is not for sale, so that, by this means, his proper control over his own becomes almost annihilated. The cause is indefiniteness in our obligations. The remedy is definiteness in our obligations. Let every transaction be an individual one, resting on its own merits, and not mixed up or united with another. If A lends B a hammer, and he thinks the cost of doing so is worthy of notice, let B pay it at once, or give a representative of an equivalent, if it is unworthy of notice, it should be entirely disregarded, and never be mixed up with its value, nor referred to in future transactions. It is only by thus individualizing of our transactions and their elements, that each citizen can enjoy the legitimate control over his own person, time, or property. It is only by a delicate regard to the rightful liberty of every one, and the necessity of by this means that we can distinguish a disinterested present, or act of benevolence and sympathy, from one prompted by a mercenary design. If we present a rose to a friend, it is understood to be an expression of sympathy, a simple act of moral commerce, 
and the receiver feels free from any obligation to make any other return than an expression of the natural feeling which immediately results therefrom. But if one should give half of his property to another, the receiver could not feel equally free from future indefinite obligations. Why? Perhaps, not that the property was any more valuable to the receiver than the rose, but, that it cost more. A delicate regard to the rightful liberty of every one, and the necessity of self-preservation, would seem to admonish us to make cost the limit of gratuitous favors, while those of immense value, which cost nothing, can be given and received without hesitation or reluctance, and will purify our moral commerce from any mixture with the mercenary or selfish taint, and carry it to the very highest state of perfection. We will suppose our practical operations so far progressed upon our new premises, as to require the establishment of a store. No one has money enough to stock one, and the sovereignty of each over his own at all times, seems to forbid borrowing of each other, or one becoming security for another. The most harmonious mode will be found to be for the storekeeper to borrow money outside of these operations until borrowing is unnecessary. The next best resort, though not perfectly harmonious, but which may not be seriously disturbing, is for the storekeeper to borrow very small sums from the co-operators, giving them notes for the same, payable on demand. So that if any one, for any cause, wishes to withdraw his investment, he can do so, at any time, without words. The storekeeper then proceeds, like ordinary storekeepers, to purchase on his own responsibility and risk, whatever he thinks is in demand, but he observes the time that he employs in purchasing, and on his return opens an account against the store for his labor and contingent expenses, placing the labor in one column and the money in another. He then considers what percentage will probably pay these and all in other contingencies of the business, decides on this, and lets it be as publicly known as possible, preserving, however, his liberty to change it when he thinks necessary. We will suppose this to be 6%, in money and 15 minutes labor on each dollar's worth of goods, for expenses of traveling, purchasing, insurance, losses, drayage, etc., and all the labor of keeping the store, except that of dealing out the goods. When he places them upon the shelves for sale, he marks them with these additions to prime cost, and places them in such a manner that customers can examine them, and know at once, their prices, without taking up the time and attention of the keeper but when the keeper deals out the goods he charges this item of his labor in each individual case, according to the time employed, which is measured by a clock. This arrangement sweeps away at once all the higgling and chaffering about prices, so disgusting in the present system, but which is inseparably connected with it. Perhaps when the habits engendered by it shall have been cured, the time of the keeper may be made up by regular installments of each dealer, but, as things are, while one will purchase his supplies in large quantities another will purchase in small, while one will detain him an hour in higgling another knows better, and it seems necessary that the one should have the natural advantage of his better practice, and the other exercise his bad habits at his own cost. When the keeper receives pay for his goods and his labor, he records those receipts, by a short and easy method, before the eyes of his customers, and this record shows the amount received, say 6%, in money, and a certain percent, in labor. Say 10 pounds of wheat on every dollar's worth of goods go to pay expenses, and an account of these expenses being balanced against these receipts, shows whether the keeper receives more or less than an equivalent for his labor, if more, perhaps he will reduce it, if less, he must increase his percentage. He can do this perfectly harmoniously, if the customers are allowed to know the necessity of it, which they can do, if the documents with the bills of purchase are habitually exposed upon the table at the public meetings, or in any other manner made public. See note, Equitable Stores, Appendix. In all these operations, the storekeeper acts entirely as an individual. If he wishes for counsel, he will seek it of those whom he thinks most capable of counseling. If he wishes to know the views of the whole on any point, he can obtain them at the public meetings, but having done so, he does not allow the public voice to rise above his individual prerogative, but paying as much deference to their opinions and wishes as he judges best, he proceeds upon his own individual decision, always at his own risk, 
and all is harmonious. In a similar manner can manufacturers and all other business be conducted. In a similar manner can manufacturers and all other business be conducted. If each individual is free to make any investment or to decline it, to invest one sum or another, according to his or her inclination in each case, and if the amount be so small as that the risk do not disturb the peace of its owner, and he is at liberty to withdraw it without words or conditions whenever he may choose, one may use the property of another for the general interest, without much disturbance of the general harmony, provided it be made evident to all, that the means are used for the purposes intended, and on the cost principle. So much of connected interests may not be perfectly harmonious, but the occasional discords may admonish us that the principle is wrong, and like those of music, if not too frequent and out of proportion, may serve to set off the general harmony to more advantage. Working of machinery If one person have not sufficient surplus means to procure machinery for a certain business, all will have an equal interest in assisting in establishing it, provided that each is satisfied that he will have its products at cost, but if there is no limit to their price, then they can have no such cooperating interest, the wear of the machinery and all contingent expenses, together with the labor of attendance, would constitute this cost. The owner of the machinery would receive nothing from the mere ownership of it, but as it wore away, he would receive in proportion, till at last, when it was worn out, he would have received back the whole of his original investment, and an equivalent for his labor in lending his capital and receiving it back again. Upon this principle, the benefits of the labor-saving powers of the machinery are equally dispersed through the whole community. No one portion is benefited at the cost of another. If one portion is thrown out of employment by it, the land, and all, arts and trades, and professions being open to them, so that they are easily and comfortably sustained during a new apprenticeship, they are not only not injured, but benefited by new inventions of which they receive their share of the advantages, while they turn and assist in reducing the labor still to be performed by hand, but, cost being made the limit of price, not thereby reducing ITS reward. Those engaged in these pursuits will now have less employment, but having their share of the natural wealth of the machinery, they have, in the same proportion, less demand for employment, in other words, the burden of their labor is reduced in proportion to the introduction of machinery. Thus, cost being made the limit of price, solves the great problem of machinery against labor. Rents of houses, lands, etc., being limited, rents of houses, lands, etc., being limited and determined by the same principle, those who have surplus time or means to invest for accumulation, by adapting the supply to the demand, can not only make safe investments for themselves, but at the same time be providing houses and homes for the homeless, with the exercise of nothing but simple equity, which does not lay the receiver under indefinite obligations, the worst of slavery, nor does it diminish one particle the rightful accumulations of the first party, but, on the contrary, having laid up 10,000 hours labor in houses or machinery, and receiving the amount of its depreciation as it wears out, he receives, at last, 10,000 hours which he originally invested. He lives then only upon his own accumulations, lives at his own cost, not at the cost of others who are immensely benefited by the value of his investments, while he is, perhaps, equally benefited by the division and exchange of labor, and all other social commerce with them. A proper regard to the individualities of persons' tastes, etc., would suggest that hotels be occupied by such persons as are most agreeable to each other, therefore, children generally, as well as their parents, would be much more comfortable not to be so closely mixed up as they would be in a boarding house with their parents. The connection is already, even in private families, too close for the comfort of either. Disconnection Will be found the real movement for the happiness of both, and hotels for children, according to the peculiarities of their wants and pursuits, would follow of course. I have seen infant schools, in which one woman attended twenty children not above two years old, and where the children entertained each other, taking most of their burdens on themselves, to infinitely more advantage to themselves than the best mothers could have conferred, and, perhaps, fifteen mothers were thus relieved from the most enslaving portion of their domestic labors.
and if such institutions were opened and conducted by individuals upon individual responsibilities, instead of combination, and upon the cost principle, every mother and father, and every member of every family, would be deeply interested in promoting the convenience and reducing the cost of such establishments, and in taking advantage of them. Instead of the offensive process of legislating upon the fitness of this or that person for those situations, which is rendered necessary in a combination, any individual who thought that he or she could supply the demand, might make proposals, and the patronage received would decide. This would be an entirely individual movement, there would be no use for laws, governments, or legislation, but there would be cooperating interests. Every mother would be free to send her child or not, according to her individual estimate of the proposed keeper, the arrangements, and the conditions, and it would, therefore, be a peaceful process, whereas, if every mother should be required by a government, or laws, or public opinion, to send her children, without the consent of her own individual approbation, we might expect what we always experience in combination, resistance, discord, and defeat. The individual is by nature a law unto himself or herself, and if we ever attain our objects, this is not to be overlooked or disregarded. Education. What is education? What is the power that educates? With whom will we trust the fearful power of forming the character and determining the destinies of the future race? Everything we come in contact with educates us. The educating power is in whatever surrounds us. If we would have education to qualify children for future life, then must education embrace those practices and principles which will be demanded in adult age. If we would have them practice equity toward each other in adult age, we must surround them with equitable practices and treat them equitably. If we would have children respect the rights of property in others, we must respect their rights of property. If we would have them respect the individual peculiarities and the proper liberty of others, then we must respect their individual peculiarities and their personal liberty. If we would have them know and claim for themselves, and award to others the proper reward of labor in adult age, we must give them the proper reward of their labor in childhood. If we would qualify them to sustain and preserve themselves in after life, they must be permitted to sustain and preserve themselves in childhood and in youth. If we would have them capable of self-government in adult age, they should practice the right of self-government in childhood. If we would have them learn to govern themselves rationally, with a view to the consequences of their acts, they must be allowed to govern themselves by those consequences in childhood. Children are principally the creatures of, example, whatever surrounding adults do, they will do. If we strike them, they will strike each other. If they see us attempting to govern each other, they will imitate the same barbarism. If we habitually admit the light of sovereignty in each other, and in them, then they will become equally respectful of our rights and of each other's. All these propositions are probably self-evident, yet not one of them is practicable under the present mixture of the interests and responsibilities between adults, and between parents and children. To solve the problem of education, children must be surrounded with equity, and must be equitably treated, and each and every one, parent or child, must be understood to be an individual, and must have his or her individual rights equitably respected. See Appendix, Article Education. Amusements and Instruction These, of course, would keep pace with the demand for them. Anyone who perceives that balls, concerts, reading rooms, etc., can be sustained, can open rooms for one or more of these purposes, charging for admission sufficient to pay for his labor and contingent expenses, and by taking in payment the circulating medium, of which every one may have an abundance, these institutions can be sustained at an early stage of the progress. Lectures on any subject can be obtained at little cost to each one of a class, when cost is made the limit of price for the room, lecture, attendance, etc. Natural Organization of Society It would, probably, not be advisable for less than 30 families to commence these operations, because, less than about this number could scarcely commence the exchanges, so as to derive much economy from them. For instance, two families could not sustain a shoemaker, nor a carpenter, an iron worker, nor any other indispensable profession. 
30 families might sustain some of them, by which means each could have the benefits of all. Six families could not sustain a storekeeper, probably not less than 30 could. If 50 families commenced together, the economies would be greater, a hundred families greater still, and they would be great in proportion to the size of the circle, until it became too large for interchange and correspondence. We have supposed a few pioneers to have advanced upon our new premises, and these probably would embrace one or two carpenters, perhaps a shoemaker, an iron worker, housekeeper, etc. When they have commenced their operations, they will probably see what is wanted there or in the surrounding neighborhood. If the location is sufficiently near a city to afford a market for surplus labor, the cooperators can divide their time between the two places, otherwise the greatest caution is necessary in the coming together, and the growth must be slow in proportion to the want of a sustaining demand. If some branches of business, such as stereotyping, publishing, etc., were commenced, the product of which will sell abroad, then any number, within the demand, can safely assemble at once after having provided their first accommodations. When they have arrived with their families, perhaps another carpenter can be sustained, when he and his family arrive, perhaps another mason can find sufficient employment. If each of these continually record their wants in the report of demands and supply, then anyone wishing to know whether he can be sustained has only to get someone on the premises to consult this record, from which he can judge for himself. In this manner, one after another can be added to the circle, till those lining in its circumference are too remote from the boarding house, the schools, and the public business of different kinds, then another commencement has to be made, another nucleus has to be formed, and thus in a safe and natural manner may the new elements extend themselves toward the circumference of society. Commerce, on these principles, will be proposed with individuals in foreign countries, which may give rise to similar beginnings in different parts of the world, each nucleus extending its growth outward till the circles meet obliterating all national lines, national prejudices, and national interests, and in a safe, natural, and rapidly progressive manner reorganize society, and harmonize the interests and feelings of all mankind. Conclusion I have stated the problem to be solved, I have suggested the means of its solution, and endeavored to exhibit their application in a manner to reach the plainest understanding. I have carefully withheld comments of my own, that the mind of the reader might sit in free and unbiased judgment in each case, and on every point of our subject, and I now respectfully but earnestly, invite him or her to study the adaptation of these means to their proposed ends, and to decide whether or not the problem is fully and correctly stated, whether or not the means proposed are adequate to the solution of that problem, whether or not I am correct in the following conclusions. That cost is an equitable, and the only equitable principle for the government of prices in the pecuniary commerce of mankind, that this being reduced to practice, would give to labor its legitimate reward, and its necessary and natural stimulus, that it would convert the present clashing interests of mankind into cooperating interests, and thereby sweep away the principal cause of national prejudices and national wars, would destroy all motive in the masses to invade each other, all necessity for armies, navies, and other paraphernalia for in national defense, and thereby neutralize the principal excuse for government, that by infusing into the public mind, correct and practical principles which will give a clear knowledge of the rights of each other, and at the same time raise every and one above the temptation to violate them, we can put an end to the other excuse for governmental protection, that by dispensing with government we shake off the greatest invader of human rights, the nightmare of society, that cost being made the limit of price, would give to a washerwoman a greater income than the importer of foreign goods, that this would entirely upset the whole of the present system of national trade, stop all wars arising out of the scramble for the profits of trade, and demolish all tariffs, duties, and all systems of policy that give rise to them, would abolish all distinctions of rich and poor, would enable everyone to consume as much as he produced, and, consequently, prevent anyone from living at the cost of another, without his or her consent that it would prevent the ruinous fluctuations in prices, and in business, which are the chief elements of insecurity, and which give rise to the unprincipled scramble, 
for property so prevalent in all civilized countries, in which, in the very midst of the most clamorous professions of righteousness, the rights of persons, of property, and the great interests of the whole race are practically forgotten or disregarded. That upon this principle the great problem of machinery against labor is mathematically and harmoniously solved, and that no other principles or modes of action can thus solve it. That upon this principle the disgusting and degrading features of our pecuniary commerce would be changed, and men could exchange their products with each other without degrading their own characters and destroying their self-respect in the operation. That this principle is indispensable to the security of person and property, that it would put an end to the scramble for property, which gives rise to encroachments on each other, to restrain which, government is invented and invoked, that these governments, instead of securing the rights of person and property, prove in their operations the greatest violators of all rights, and that we must work out the security of person and property without governments. That cost being made the limit of price, would necessarily produce all the co-operation, and all the economies aimed at by the most intelligent and devoted friends of humanity, and, by reducing the burthen of labor to a mere pastime or necessary exercise, would probably annihilate its cost, when, like water or amateur music, no price would be set upon it, and the highest aspirations of the best of our race would be naturally realized. That the security of person and property demands that every one shall feel secure from any external power rising above him, and controlling his person, time, or property, or involving him in responsibilities, contrary to his own individual inclination, that he must feel that he has, and always shall have, his own destiny in his own hands, that he shall always be sovereign of himself and all his own interests, that this sovereignty of the individual is directly opposed to all external or artificial government, that this sovereignty of the individual is impracticable in national, state, church, or reform combinations. And that combination is, therefore, exactly the wrong condition for the security, peace, and liberty of mankind. That the true movement for the attainment of these ends, is for each individual to commence immediately to disconnect his person and all his interests from combinations of every description, and to assume the entire control of them as fast as they can be sufficiently separated from others, so that he can control his own, without controlling them. That a rational circulating medium, a definite representative of property, that a rational circulating medium, a definite representative of property on equitable principles, has never been known to mankind, that all the great money transactions of the world, all banks and banking operations, all stock jobbing, all money corporations and money movements, all systems of finance, and all the money business of the world, have been based upon shells, medals, and pictures, things which are no better qualified for a circulating medium, than a floating log is fit for a boundary of a piece of land. That all the legislative action on this subject has been conducted in the most profound ignorance of what a circulating medium should be, or legislators have abused their trust, and sold the people to their enemies. That a rational and equitable circulating medium, together with cost as the limit of price, would strike at the root of all political, commercial, and financial corruption, and contribute largely to establish equity, security, liberty, equality, peace, and abundance, wherever it shall be introduced. That all interests and responsibilities must be entirely individualized, before the legitimate liberty of mankind can be restored, before each one can be sovereign of his own without violating the sovereignty of others. That the sovereignty of every individual is not only indispensable to security, but constitutes the natural liberty of mankind, and must be restored back to each, before society can be harmonious. That the sovereignty of the individual becoming a new element in public opinion, and thereby constituting each the supreme deciding power for himself at all times, would put an end to all discordant controversies on all subjects, disarm all laws and governments of their desolating power, and, that with an habitual regard to this right in every one, no one's time or attention would be taken up, nor their thoughts or feelings disturbed, against his or her inclination, and that our social intercourse would thus become purified, refined, and exalted, 
to the very highest conceivable state of perfection, that the natural tendency of these new elements of society is to abolish all the cause of crimes, and all the horrid inventions for punishment, and to take away the last excuse of men for their insane cruelty to each other. That the sovereignty of the individual constitutes the largest liberty to each individual, that liberty defined and limited by others is slavery. That everyone has an inalienable right to define this and all other words for himself or herself, and, therefore, that no one has any right to define them for others, and, therefore, that all verbal institutions which demand conformity in their interpretations are as false in principle as they have proved pernicious in practice. That the great problem of education has never been practically solved, nor can it be solved upon any of the principles upon which society is now acting, but, that the study of natural individualities, with these natural deductions from Thorn, point out a solution at once simple, truthful, beautiful, and sublime. Finally, that the five elements of new society herein set forth, together with other modern discoveries and inventions, are capable, if reduced to practice, of adjusting, harmonizing, and regulating the pecuniary, intellectual, and moral intercourse of mankind, and of elevating the condition and character of our race to the fulfillment of the highest aspirations and purest hopes of the most devoted friends of humanity. The Practicability with regard to the practicability of our propositions, every one will form his own individual estimate of this. A few have practical proofs which others have not. Different estimates will be formed on internal evidences, and this part, at least, of our subject, individuality, is practically at work and demonstrates itself. If every one is free to differ, and no attempt is made to change any one's views or action against his inclination, Another practical step is gained, but with regard to the movement as a whole, it is addressed, first of all, to the noble few whose intellects and hearts have not been destroyed by the prevailing cannibalism of the world, and whose last hope has not become entirely extinguished by the repeated failures of enterprises having similar objects in view. It is confidently believed that a few such persons can be found, who, by making a commencement, will immediately start a power into existence which is perfectly irresistible by the strongest opposers of reformation, a power, to which all their opposition, all their deep-laid plans, their wordy warfare, their bitterest hostility, must become as chaff before the wind, this power is competition. The competition of equitable commerce invades no one's right of person or property, it reduces no one's labor below equivalence, but it will bring everyone to this position in defiance of any resistance that may be offered. No one can sell house lots for $5,000, while anyone will sell them of equal value for $5, and one person can buy and sell all the lots required by thousands. No one can sell coffee at 16 cents a pound, where anyone will sell it equally good for 10 cents, and one person can sell coffee and sugar to thousands. No one can get $5 per hour for visiting the sick, when another, whose services are equally valuable, can be obtained for an equivalent. No lawyer can get $100 per hour, when another will do the business as well for an equal amount of labor. If it be objected that the first beginnings cannot be made, we meet this with the fact, that there is no branch of necessary knowledge that is not now accessible immediately to those who want employment and that in the professions mentioned, the durations of the customary apprenticeships do not generally equal those of the cabinet maker, the iron worker, or the carpenter, and that where profit is not made by concealment and mystery, any demand can be very readily supplied, and that any number of any profession, which is likely to be wanted, can be qualified in from two to three years. Competition is an element of society so well known and understood, that no illustration is necessary to show that where one person will deal more for the interest of the public than another, he will get all the business, or others must come to his prices, and that in this position one person can wield an immeasurable power. The competition of equitable commerce exerts this power upon all professions that are paid above equivalence, and the natural propensity for self-preservation raises those below up to equivalence. The power of money itself, which wields all other powers, must sink into imbecility in competition with a rational circulating medium, 
and those who possess the most money, may suddenly find themselves the most powerless and most dependent of men. It is folly for any parties to hope any longer to delay the general emancipation and natural equality of the race. The ostrich, who hides his head in the sand, while his body is exposed to the huntsman, does not exhibit a more fatal self-conceit than those who expect that rank, name, money, political power, or Jesuitical craft can any longer exempt them from the great, the harmonious destiny of humanity. It has now become a very common sentiment, that there is some deep and radical wrong somewhere, and that legislators have proved themselves incapable of discovering or remedying it. With all due deference to other judgments, I have undertaken to point out what seems to constitute this wrong, and its natural, legitimate, and efficient remedies, and shall continue to do so wherever and whenever the subject receives that attention and respect to which its unspeakable importance appears to entitle it, and it is hoped that some who are capable of correct reasoning will undertake to investigate, and, if they can find a motive, to oppose equitable commerce, and thereby discover and expose the utter imbecility, the surprising weakness of any opposition that can be brought against it. Opposition, in order to be noticed, must be confined to this subject, and its natural tendencies, disconnected from all others, and all merely personal considerations. To those who have neither eyes to see nor hearts to feel, I quote the words of Rouvre, announced in St. Domingo only a few months before the streets were choked with conflict and corpses, and running with human gore. Learn, said he, that indecent clamor may force to silence, but will never refute true reasoning, founded upon the authority of existing facts or true history. One day, perhaps, the cries of scorn with which you repay the announcement of important truths will be changed to tears of blood. My most anxious hope is that this prophecy may not prove applicable to all civilized countries. I decline all noisy, wordy, confused, and personal controversies. This subject is presented for calm study, an honest inquiry, and, after having placed it fairly before the public, I shall leave it to be estimated by each individual according to the peculiar measure of his understanding, and shall offer no violence to his individuality, by any attempt to restrain or to urge him beyond it. Josiah Warren New Harmony, Indiana, U.S., 1846. Appendix.